Your life is your greatest work of art, and it all relates back. Welcome, everybody. I'm your host, Allison Polo, and you're listening to Integrate Yourself Podcast. And you can find me at finally thrivingbook.com and alisonpillow.com. Today, I'm here with my good friend, Andrew Garrett. He is a published and award-winning chef who has a passion for food and life, thanks to countless adventures and travel around the globe. Having grown up in Sonoma, California, Andrew quickly developed an appreciation for all things local. While serving for the U.S. Army in Germany, he was able to spend many weekends traveling to France and Tuscany, where he felt right at home enjoying local delicacies such as wine and cheese, and in his leisure, forging and taking up butchery. Andrew is enamored with French and Italian culture and cuisine and its regional diversity. His passion for ingredients is quintessential in bringing his patrons the best possible recipes and sauces. Andrew is excited to share his sense of adventure and thirst for knowledge and inspire anyone with a passion for great food. He's also been on Chopped and Supermarket Stakeout, which uh, was really cool to be on. I'd love to hear your experience about uh, with that, Andrew, and um, he's also just an amazing chef, and we're going to get into um, how he got into that uh, and, and the type of chef he prefers to be, local food foraging and, and those kinds of things, as well as um, just, uh, you know, what he's doing, what he's doing with it now. We're just going to get into all of that, and I'm so excited to have you here, Andrew. Andrew's a good friend, and this has been a long time coming, so I'm so excited we're finally doing this. Yeah, we finally made it happen. <laughs> exactly. We kept talking about it for a while, right? Like, And then finally, we did it. So, yeah. So, Andrew, um, man, you have such a diverse background. You've been on reality TV shows. You have your own hot sauce business. You know, you've, you're, you've been a chef for professional athletes. Um, and so... Kind of just give us an idea, give my audience an idea of how you got to be doing what you're doing, because it's quite, uh, it's really special. It's it's a special thing to offer people. So I would love to hear more about that, how you got there. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, very, very, very stoked to be here and talking to you about, about me. Yeah, it is my favorite subject, so uh but how I got started, really, it goes back to growing up. Um, my parents were caretakers on a 12-acre fruit farm uh, in a little town called Glen Ellen, which is just outside Sonoma. A lot of people just kind of group it together with Sonoma. Uh, but I grew up there as an only child, and so I had a plethora of chores. And my dad worked early in the morning. My mom worked uh, through mid to evening. So I was home alone a lot. And, you know, I have to get myself to the school bus, get off the school bus, get back to the house and then take care of whatever chores I had to do. Um, but with that, growing up on the farm, my father was a great cook, fantastic cook. Um, and a lot of times, you know, we were we were just going out to our garden and picking fresh vegetables and cooking straight off of there. Um, I was fortunate enough to spend a lot of weekends hunting with my father, uh, even just days that we would walk out to our front porch and you could shoot quail. Uh, straight straight off the front porch you know there's a flock of 50 60 birds right there and you know shoot them go out there clean them up take them inside and and cook them all alongside like fresh zucchini or fresh jalapenos fresh cayennes like you know all these my experience was was so different I mean even the crick running behind the house you know you go out there and I could catch three or four trout and bring them upstairs and cook them um, so growing up, it, that was my experience, you know, and I mean, just the hills around that area were also full of chanterelle mushrooms. And so, you know, in the fall, we'd go pick mushrooms. And, and that was my, that was my introduction to the, the, in my mind, that's how food was. Um, when I got to 12, my parents had divorced when I was six, uh, we moved into the city and I was far away from that. And that's when I got introduced to things like fast food, um, and it was so much different than actually walking out to the garden. And, you know, I, I found myself really missing it. Um, at the same time, I was very fortunate to be a, a really good 
athlete. Um, you know, I, I was, I was good at sports just kind of naturally. I, I picked them up. They made sense. I love team atmospheres. And so I was playing all these different sports and my performance is I, is when I reflect on it, like at that time, I, I have no idea what I'm talking about at 12 years old. I wouldn't know what it, you know, when I reflect back on it, I look at the correlation between how I was eating from six to 12 versus 13 to, to 20. And my performance was in line with that, just my, my energy levels. Uh, but you know, again, being so fortunate to grow up in a place where riding my bike every day throughout the summer, riding it for miles at a time to go to a fishing hole or, you know, go out to the mountains and go hunting. Uh, it, that's really where, my passion for food really settled in. Um, I think the the bigger part of it really was uh, in my formative years, my parents were were at odds on a regular basis. There's a lot of arguing, a lot of bickering. And the only time that things were ever calm or settled were at the dinner table. It was the only time that we ever had any kind of, you know, calm or consistent was in those moments. Um, and so I, I think, uh, especially, I, you know, it's funny is after, I, you know, after reading your book, um, it really helped me to dive into some of those things that were experiences that I didn't realize had such a, uh, impact on my, my long, long-term life and goals and feelings and emotions. Uh, and so that's, a, that's where the real depth of food and dining and eating uh, really came together for me, uh, you know, after reflecting yeah. back, that's where it landed. Yeah, so. that, that's incredible. Yeah. And so it really, um, cooking for you and, uh, and providing people with this kind of service really provides a service to yourself on a deeper level to connect more with your family. And when you felt like that was really, um, those times are really good, right. It has like that, that feeling for you that you're continuing to, uh, revisit, you know, through your cooking and, and offerings that way. So that that's incredible. And, and yeah, it sounds like that you, you got that early on that, that connection with food that many people don't get, you know, and that's so rare these days, but, um, it's amazing when we take those experiences and share that with other people, because it's, it really does connect us, um, into even the deeper aspects of what, you know, meals, like you were saying, what meals really mean to us, what um, this time spent together eating really means, you know, it's, it's, it's changed so much through the nutrition industry, the fitness industry, you know, it's like, it's just gotten so convoluted and complex about how we eat, but really it's so simple and heart centered in a way. Right. And that's what I love about what you do and what you offer people. Well, it's a trip. Um, so I, I collect cookbooks um, back behind me. I mean, a, a lot of those are, are cookbooks. And I have a handful of books that are from the 19, early 1900s to, you know, mid 1940s. And then from the 40s to the 70s to the 80s, 90s and the present day. And it's really interesting to watch, you know, you, you look at recipes from 1910. Um, I've got a Better Homes and Garden cookbook from 1915. And you look at that book and you look at the recipes and you look at, you know, you go out and pick time from your garden. You go out and get eggs from your coop. You, you know, it, the, the instructions are the, almost a manual for homesteading, what we would call homesteading now, but that was life. And then, you know, you fast forward to 1940, 1950, all of a sudden everybody's coming home from the great war. Life is, it becomes a lot faster. It becomes a lot more important. You know, we have two parents that are both working. Uh, and so the time that we were taking to cook is now reduced. You know, we, we go from, from 12, 14 hours of preparation to this, you know, 45 minute window. And then you fast forward to 1960, 1970, and that 20 minute window turns into a 15 minute window. And then the eighties and nineties, and we're into a five minute window. All of a sudden, you know, we have to hustle and move and hustle and move and hustle and move. And that's just not the way we're designed as humans, in my, in my opinion. I don't think that's the way we're designed as humans. You know, we, we're designed to be outdoors and, and experiencing 
nature and exploring and foraging and finding these ingredients. Now it's it's a game of convenience, you know. And I think uh, somewhere in the the late '60s, early '70s, uh, food manufacturing really took advantage of that, and we started to look for ways to how can we can things and make them last longer than they already do? How can we add preservatives that we don't necessarily need in food? And so you look at the transition from manufacturing ingredients being vinegar, some spices and herbs in a jar that you can to, oh, here's this ready to eat meal that's full of sodium, uh, sodium by uh, grain lidded sugar, uh, uh, chloride, chloride dioxides, uh, and then any other number of hidden ingredients, you know, and it's really fascinating to, to look at that and kind of see where, where, where we've really taken a hard beer, uh, in our food chain. Uh, it, it's, it's wild to me that, you know, and, and there's folks that are my age that have eaten that way their whole life. They've never experienced. And like you said, it's like, having that experience growing up is no one gets to do that anymore. You know, I mean, even now, yeah. you know, I, I've got a handful of friends that have kids and they're constantly going from one thing to the other, one thing to the other, you know, you have to be, it's almost like folks have to be doing things. Uh, yeah. It's like a trauma response, like busyness, right? It's so it, interesting to me too, to think about that. Cause I've done it. I, I did it uh, in my life. I was a, you know, an athlete. So we were running from, you know, one thing to the next four hours in the gym, coming home like at eight or nine o'clock in the evening. So it's like, there wasn't really a lot um, of space for cooking. And, and my parents were always driving us places. And so uh, we had to go to McDonald's sometimes, you know, because that was really the only, the only way to kind of fit that meal in. But even before I really became, got into athletics, like I remember my dad really spending time on gardening. He had this huge garden out back and we'd get a lot of our food out of the garden. So would my relatives, uh, you know, that lived in the neighborhood as well. And so most of my food, uh, my aunt who I'd stay with in the summertime, most of her food came from her backyard garden, you know, that we'd eat, she'd make us for lunch. And so um, I was so I was so happy that I got to experience that before I started to experience the life of the athlete, you know, and the rushing around and um, because it really did, you know, as I got older, I, I, I come I have come back to, you know, what is uh, very simple and natural and like what's the most natural thing is for us to grow food, right? It's and pick it out of our backyard and and you, we have all have access to that. It's just prioritizing the time to do it and, and learning about it, you know? And so, but many people don't make time for that because we prioritize so many other things that in, and sometimes I think it just, it isn't like progress. Like it feels like progress, but when you look at it, is it really progress, you know? And so getting back to what is real because, you know, we're all doing things a lot on the computer. I'm one of those people. And is that really the real world? You know, is that a reflection of our real world or is it what we're looking at outside, you know, and seeing what's growing in our backyard, seeing what we can, you know, being still and present for our meals so we can have a healthy digestion and really having gratitude for that, like true appreciation. And so that's where I think that space, taking that space with your meal is, this is something I teach my uh, my students and my program is how to just be present with your meals and uh, even go through some kind, not necessarily religious thing, but like blessing your food and appreciating it and like sending that energy into the food before you bring it into your body, because that is really um you know, an important intention to set, um, this will help you be more healthy, you know, and have, um, just more, uh, more of a view of abundance in your life. That's a little bit different than material goods or money, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It, a lot of folks just don't, they, they never have that opportunity. You know, I mean, it, it baffles me still today that, you know, I, I run into some clients that, you know, I work as a personal chef, uh, with a lot of clients and, some clients have no idea where things come from still, you know, I mean, you know, I grew up raising hogs and steers, so 
I know that, you know, when I put that time and effort into raising this animal and then it's on the dinner table, like I don't have a Disney, uh, I guess, it, yeah, I guess that's really what it is, is I don't have that Disney association to it is I don't have that. Oh my gosh, that's babe, the pig that talks like that's not like, oh no, that's Amos. We're going to eat him in six months when he's big enough to, to harvest at a, at a proper size. And we're going to feed him all these good ingredients. We're not just going to, you know, toss him in a pin stacked on top of, you know, six other animals and then, well, I guess it's time and then throw it into a, you know, a giant processor. Um, yeah. Know, so it, you have respect for the animal, right? It's, it's a yeah. respectful process and it's so, it's so, so most people are exposed to conventional ways of doing that. Right. So would you want, maybe share just the difference between that, um, and a, you know, a more restorative, uh, or regenerative farming technique. Oh yeah. I mean, there, the way that, that again, kind of getting back to my, my timeline there of, of the fifties to seventies, I guess we could expand it a little bit is we went from, you know, raising these animals ourselves to going to our local butcher who was getting their animals from their local rancher, you know, and we're talking, you know, 500 to 1500 head of cattle. And then all of a sudden we're in this, oh my God, we don't have time in the seventies and eighties. And we start to see the, the real rise in industrialized farming, right? So we start stacking animals in the smallest possible area. Um, and it creates so many problems because now we're, you know, it, if you think about, you know, a, a human living, right? Like a humans living stacked on top of each other is, is not an ideal situation for humans. And a lot of times we see a lot of illnesses that are psychologically, emotionally uh, established in those, those areas, right? So animals are the same way. And when we start stacking these animals and just like, we need to just turn, turn a process, turn a process, turn a process. We need to produce produce, produce, uh, the invention of, of mass freezing, right? Like the amount of, and again, there's now for me, there's nothing wrong with frozen protein, frozen fish, frozen meats. There's nothing wrong with it. But when we're producing something to store it for future use, that's where we start to get into these problems because now we're just turning something over, you know, um, canning is a, is a great example of that. And overall food manufacturing, I think in America today, we produce something like 890 trillion calories a day. Um, we consume as Americans something like 350 trillion. So we have this de deficit that's almost 500 trillion calories, right? But yet we have people starving in America because they're not being, they're not receiving nutrient dense food. They're not actually eating things that are close to them. They're eating things that are from thousands and thousands of miles away. Uh, so even that, like even chemically like laden stuff too, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it it's not, in my opinion, it's it's not how we're supposed to eat. You know, we're not supposed to eat these things that have all these preservatives. And you know, we're we're hunter-gatherers. And for my own personal, you know, I feel the best, I perform the best when I'm eating something that is gone from a raw, fresh state to a prepared state. Uh, versus canned or fast food. And don't get me wrong, like I indulge, <laughs> I indulge, um, you know, it, it, it's one of my, one of my things. But yeah, the, the disconnection between where our food comes from and how we consume it, uh, we really don't spend that time. And I think that's why I really like most about the personal and private chef work that I do now is I get to enjoy those dinners with my clients. And, uh, you know, even though I'm preparing them, wow. my animals. Is that your I cat? Yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, they know I'm, they know I'm doing interviews. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, getting back to the story, um, you know, taking that time to slow down with a client and seeing their progress, you know, I, and it's really cool working with these professional athletes because there's a tangible result from my, my experience and my uh, cooking is I can see how well they perform or how, what, how good they feel when they're training or weightlifting. Because um, I think in, you know, your athlete, the old school idea of chicken and rice and tuna, chicken and rice and tuna, chicken and rice and tuna, 
eat yeah. a bunch of pasta the night before your football game. Like that whole mentality of like carb loading the night before has completely been debunked, but yet we're still, there are still places where these athletes are coming from that those are, that's still the standard. Yeah. Right? I can see and that. Yeah. It's, it's hard to break that. And so I've had clients ask me to make them chicken nuggets. And I'm like, sir. That's I... the funny thing I've noticed too, like being an, being an athlete coming out of that world, it, you would think that as times have changed with um, our awareness of organic food, higher quality food, and, and th those kinds of things that would have trickled into the athletic uh, arena, but it has not. And it seems to be that even with the professional athletes, which just surprises me, but it's starting to, um, there, there are some athletes that are starting to realize how, how beneficial cleaner organic food does for their performance. You know, um, one of my mentors, Paul check, uh, worked with, I think first Kobe Bryant and changed his mind about that. And I think then he influenced, uh, some people when he was alive in, in the NBA as well towards that. And then, so you're doing a, the same thing. You're just educating them like, Hey, you know, yeah, you can do this. You can, you can perform at a high level with this crap diet, but could you could do even better, even better, like because athletes are looking for that edge, right? Even mm. better for restoration, um, uh, coming back from injuries, those kinds of things with a cleaner organic diet, you know, and it's really easy for them to implement because they it's not about money for them, really. And, and you know, so it's just about education, right? And, and value. Yeah, it's uh, the athlete that I'm working with right now currently, actually, you know, he's uh, I it's we've worked together for three years during his off seasons and it's taken that amount of time to, to build that trust of like, look, what I'm going to give you is is going to help and what I'm recommending is going to help. And, you know, we're three years in and he's like, yeah, you just do whatever you want, Chef G, like, you know, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. You know, and I, I brought him uh, two quarts of beef bone broth, right? Like real beef bone broth. I was like, Hey, when you're hungry during the day, like if you're snacking, drink eight ounces of this and, you know, don't snack, just drink this. And we've done that for three weeks. And he's like, I don't want to snack because you're totally satiated, right? Because you're getting these really truly nutrient dense ingredients that are, you know, helping, helping to curb those, those, you know, instant gratification moments of like, oh, I'm just going to grab some chips. Oh, you know, yeah. even though this, this beef jerky is seemingly healthy, it's not, you know? Uh, and so it's fun to, to help folks learn and then watch them feel better, play better, and just have these, these really cool uh, growth opportunities. Um, you know, I, I've got him eating no carbs, right? No carbs at dinner. That's, that's my rule of them. I'm like, look, like if you're going to eat carbs, eat them in the morning and, and do them with a, you know, a, an oatmeal or something that's going to be a simple, quick digesting. You're going into your workouts, you're going into your games, like it'll burn, right? Because before the mentality of, oh, I'm going to eat all these carbohydrates at night before I go to bed and then wake up oh my gosh, why am I sluggish? Why do I feel so bad? It's because our, our body doesn't process them. And that's yeah. taken me a ton of learning, right? Like unlearning everything I was ever taught playing athletics at, at a medium high level. It's like, yeah. whoa. And I'm fortunate because I've had a handful of mentors who have taken the time to, to talk to me about these things. You know, um, yeah, Liam is probably my, my number one resource for, uh, Hey, what do you think about this? You know, because he dives into things so deeply. You're another one of my resources. Like, hey, what has this been like for you? And even like reading your book is going through and, and the parts where you're talking about how you were eating and why you were eating. Like I related so directly to that and unlearning it for myself so that I can pass that to others is it, that, in a, that in itself is a great experience for me, right? Like, Thank you. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. It's all about hormonal um, balance too, you know? And, and so with athletes, like they're always, a lot of them tr do the, um, what is it? Hormonal supplementation, like a testosterone. I don't know what the name of it, all those are, but they, um, get growth hormones and stuff, but 
Really, like you could do that naturally with your food if you knew how to do it right. And that's one of the things I do talk about in my book. Um, it is more for kind of, uh, for more for people who are just super busy and have a low thyroid function, low metabolic function um, and how to change their hormone uh, to favor their metabolism. But with the athletes, I mean, it can be a similar thing, you know, so um, because a lot of them are just working so hard and it does slow down uh, their metabolism if they're not keeping up with it, with the food aspect. So um, that's why they might need the hormones sometimes because their metabolism is actually slowing down because they're not able to give it enough fuel or the right fuel to run you know, properly, like it, it's supposed to. So, cause they're just putting so much stress on their body and, and, you know, being an athlete myself, I can understand that. But, um, so I, that's why I tell my clients, like it's the recovery process that to focus on. And part of that is food, right. Eating the right foods, right time, uh, just really supporting and nourishing yourself and not depleting too much. I mean, depletion is going to lead to low energy levels. It's going to lead to your body breaking down over time, your connective tissue as well. So this is so important for us to really bring in that high quality food um, intentionally in the diet, especially if we're doing a lot of activity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it's wild. And I mean, the way the body reacts is, have you seen the the recent information they've been putting out about caffeine and cortisol production? No, but I have my own thoughts on that. But what, what have you seen about it? What are they saying so these days? There, there is a direct correlation between caffeine and cortisol production uh, in the human body. So caffeine is a stimulant and it gives us that same like fight or flight essentially is what is triggering is that fight or flight mode. And what they found is that later in the day, if we're drinking caffeine, say past two, three o'clock in the afternoon, some people are like, oh, I'm immune to caffeine, but I can't seem to lose this belly fat. Mm, well, yeah. this group of researchers looked at it and they realized that people that were drinking caffeine later in the day, their cortisol production was like way, way up. And, uh, you know, so I, I personally stopped drinking caffeine after 11 a.m. and yeah. I immediately noticed within three to four days of like my, my energy level being significantly greater going through the day and then waking up without that like hormonal uh, hangover, you know? Yeah. So, you know, my body didn't feel like it was in fight or flight mode all night. And my nice hard night rest of sleep. Like I used to drink caffeine just <laughs> all day well, long. Yeah. That was the nature of your job, right? Being in the restaurant yeah. industry. We're so in many people do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, my thoughts on it are, yeah, similar. It, it, I, I agree. It's, uh, I do coffee. Like I usually do one cup in the morning. I do my best to eat with the coffee. Like I, I always tell my clients, don't just drink coffee by itself first thing in the morning. If you have to do that, then just eat pretty soon after so that that will curb the cortisol, the excess cortisol. Cause we already have a lot of natural cortisol going in the morning that's natural for us to do that the sun actually um it actually activates that cortisol production naturally in your body really? by hitting you the sun hitting your skin yeah so um which is we're supposed to have that to wake us up in the morning but then yes if you keep trying to keep your uh, ramp your nervous system up through the day with that then yes you're gonna it's going to be unnatural for you to be doing that because as the day progresses you should be lowering your cortisol levels so that you can have a nice restful sleep at night uh, of course screens will do that too if we're not wearing uh, glass you know blue light glasses during the the evening to watch our tv or do something on the computer if we're stressing ourselves out mentally emotionally right before we go to bed same thing so all these things, yes, can, can produce cortisol, but yeah, just, yeah. Eliminating coffee later in the day, like make a rule, like no coffee past, like, I don't know, like 10 or 12, you know, noon or something, you know, could do something if you're really into it, but I usually just drink one cu cup in the morning. I'm good to go. And, uh, yeah, it, it, like you said, I think then you just get back to your natural circadian rhythm which is not being up all day, like crazy adrenaline levels, right? We have to curb those adrenaline levels a little bit. And we do that through, through food as well. So food helps us regulate our blood sugar. So our adrenaline levels stay um, at a certain level during the day, our stress hormones aren't going 
off all the time, you know, and that's another thing that leads to um, not great sleep is if we're not handling the blood sugar uh, during the day too. So yes, all those things, I agree, you know, caffeine does have some health effects that, that you can benefit from, but you do have to do it Yep, you do have to use it wisely. So like, uh, you know, earlier in the morning and with food is what I recommend. <clears throat> you hit on something that that also is just like been hot with me right now. Is I, you know, I, I bounce from what's hot and what's not. You know, every every week there's something new. Uh, but I recently read a book by a, a gentleman named Michael Easter. It's called The Comfort Crisis. Um, and he essentially he asks a ton of questions of really intelligent people, researchers across the globe um, and seeks out answers to why things, you know, why the human body reacts certain ways to different things. Um, and one of the chapters, he goes into um, why people that spend time in nature have such a, a lower level of anxiety, depression, stressors, overall you know, and he's one of these people like he worked for Men's Health magazine. He was an editor there and, you know, he lived in, in big cities and he was one of those folks. I was like, oh, you know what? The city doesn't bother me. Like, you know, I'm just, you know, doing my daily thing, doing my daily grind. But the reality that he found was that living in this city surrounded by so many millions of people really does a number on us. And even though we, we've, we've trained ourselves, uh, myself included, to to have this idea of like, I must constantly be going and I have to be around people that are constantly going. We don't stop to go outside anymore. And what one of these, these studies that he found in Japan is they go out and they do what they call forest bathing. And oh, they yeah. spend 20 minutes, three days a week in the woods, no cell phones, no earphones, just in the woods around nature. And this is within city limits, like, you know, just being around trees and bushes and greens and shrubbery. The people that do this, their anxiety level dropped by like something like 25 to 30%, like this just ungodly wow. number. And I was look, I'm reading this, I'm like, that's absolutely nuts. And I happened to be, you know, in one of my grooves where I was outside hiking every single day, every single day, 45 minutes, just going for a walk. I live in a neighborhood that's surrounded by trees and nature. No headphones, no phone, just walking. And it was amazing to see the calm that I experienced in my life is like just being outside. Um, I just got back. I spent the, the month of June uh, working as a camp chef for a, an outfitting guide in Idaho. Oh, yeah. No <laughs> cell phone, no internet, no emails, no cars, no buildings, just trees, tents, camps, fire. And that's it. And adjusting back to real life in the beginning of the July it's it's taking me it's August so it's taking me four weeks to really settle back into being in a city because it just feels so unnatural to me it's it yeah it, it just it's blowing my mind I'm just like elk season starts in 32 days and so now I'm just like counting the days until I get to the woods again um and so it's yeah they we don't spend enough time outside and I think that that's one of those things that if folks just took that 20 minutes to go stand by a tree and enjoy the calm of that, it would decrease so much stress in their lives. That's yeah. uh, wise just, words, uh, wise words. Yes. Yeah. It's that's so true. And it's so simple, but people, you know, our mind, our ego wants to make everything so complex, right? So that's, <laughs> it's the ego that wants to make life complex and make it hard, but it's, really easy. Um, <clears throat> it's just that I think the hard part is for most people, especially if they're addicted to busyness, which we all are, you know, to some extent, right? Um, I think the problem lies uh, is prioritizing time for yourself, like having enough self-worth to even give yourself that space to do that, because we always feel like we need to fill that space up with things like we must be doing something, we must be, you know, productive and, and, like we've been told, you know, this is what, you know, a program to do these things. 
But if you really get to the heart of who you are and, and find the truth within that, then you understand that really, you don't really have to do anything. And if you come from that center place of peace within yourself, then you get to actually do what you want to do instead of doing what you feel like you should be doing. So that's a big energetic shift right there. And so um, I feel like there's nothing better than nature to show you that because we are nature. We're a part of it. When we get out in it, we connect with it because we, that's our natural space. What we're doing right now is so unnatural, but we've been living in it for so long. We think it's natural, right? But what we're learning is, no, that's not the natural way to live. It's not organic. You know, this is not organic life. Organic life is is nature. So because our bodies are our nature, you know, it's organic, our bodies are organic life, you know? And yeah. so when we connect with that, we connect with the messages that, you know, I've even been like looking into te uh, telepathy lately, like how we have this natural innate ability to have telepathic communication. It sounds really out there and something super scientific because that's what we've been trained to think about that. But it's actually, if you thought about it, it's you, you're do it, you've done it before, you, you know, it's just that now we have computers and we have phones that kind of provide that synthetic telepathy for us. But if we were thinking about our innate natural telepathy, when we go out in nature, we actually hear, we hear, you know, sounds, we connect with, with the, uh, the voice of nature, so to speak. Uh, we feel more in in tune with ourselves, which helps us really being in, in tune with others. So, um, you know, in a way, just, you know, thinking about someone or, or, you know, them thinking about you and then you're, they pop in your head, like that's a form of telepathy, but we, it, it's hard for us to connect with those kinds of ways of uh, communicating and connecting when we're, when we're all caught up in, in the old programming of what we thought was natural, right. In the modern life. So I think that it's such a profound experience and lesson to, to start doing that force bathing, even just a little bit, like you're saying 20 minutes a day will build into so much more. And you're going to, you're going to really build your inner knowing your intuition and, you know, that form of communication that goes beyond, what we're using right now, you know, it's, it's like, this is amazing to think about for me anyway, you know? Yeah, no, it's um, crazy. Cause then you, if you, if you think about, you know, the original humans, the original hunter gatherers, right. And, and scientists and biologists and uh, what's the word uh, anthropologists look at, Oh, well, they didn't have a written language. They drew mm -hmm. these pictures. Well, if you think it, it getting on the telepathy side of things is like these folks were communicating from long distances hunting and gathering with one another like there we are wired as humans and even you know i can see you can see it in nature you know if you watch a, a predator hunt its prey or you know wolves are a great example is watching wolves work together without any noise at all like there's this this symbiotic relationship that exists between all of them and the way that they work together and that's the way humans are so i it, yeah the telepathy side of things i i definitely uh yeah it, it's a trip to think about it and you know but it's one of those things that definitely exists because it happens in daily life when you let go of things you know exactly. and yeah it, I, I wouldn't be experiencing what i'm experiencing now um you know i, I read your book when i first started reading again i you were my first book and it really unlocked like the joys. And one of the things that stood out to me most was like being in the gym. Cause I love going to the gym. Like that's my, my sanity, but it's always a very serious thing. I got to go. And when you speak to letting your inner child out and dancing in the gym and being barefoot in the gym and just like enjoying that moment in there, when I started doing that, it unlocked this whole new world of, oh, I could actually get, go in this gym and I could listen to some ridiculous music. I could listen to Paula Abdul and have a great time dancing around barefoot in my gym, right? And then I go into reading Michael Easter's book and it's like, your book unlocked the door and opened it for me. And then I get into his book where he's talking about all this nature and like all of a sudden, like everything is just like expanded further. And I don't, you know, you nail it. It's like, we don't, we take ourselves way too seriously. 
you know, and that's the way we're, we're programmed. And, and you're right. It's like the ego is that, that driving force of why we're this way, right? Cause we have to be, we have to be next. And then we live in a world where, you know, we have false idols that are millions of followers. Oh, I've got a million followers. Oh, well, that person must be what I'm supposed to be. And then we chase that. And, you know, we're chasing someone else's goals. We're not setting our own personal goals. We're not doing what's right for us. We're doing what we think is right for others. But our ego becomes so attached to that, we can't separate. You know, you mentioned the hot sauce company earlier. You know, we closed that two years ago. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done, not from a, a business standpoint, but from an ego self perspective is like people know me as the hot sauce guy I'm the, I'm the sauce guy like oh you're the hot sauce guy you know I've got the tattoos yeah like and separating myself like the loss of that ego was was huge and I had no idea I was experiencing it um and it's it's taken me two years to really finally realize oh I'm just Andrew I'm not Jeff. I'm not the hot sauce guy. I'm just Andrew. And that's all I have to be. Like, I don't have to be chasing dollar bills every day. And, it, you know, it, and that's the other thing is like, as soon as I stopped chasing dollar bills, my life got so much simpler and just started doing the things that I like doing. And my bills are paid, there's a roof over my head. Like, you know, just day by day, like everything's going to be okay. But it starts with separating that ego and just being okay being being me, right? I mean, I, tomorrow, what's today? Today's the third. Tomorrow, I'll be 16 years sober, right? Congratulations. <laughs> again, it's like a miracle in and of itself is, is, but again, you know, I was using and drinking because I thought that I had to be this person. Like, I wasn't comfortable with my own skin. Like, I couldn't go to an, I couldn't go to an event. I couldn't go to a party. I couldn't go to work unless I was high or drunk, I couldn't do those things because I was so associated with, you know, oh, I have to do this to be cool. I have to be the center of attention. I want people to know me, know who I am, know who I am. And, you know, after I cut that off and I, you know, it probably five years before I really was like, okay, being me, you know, there's five years of like, just really uncomfortable. And then finally just kind of like settled in. But again, a lot of that was getting back to spirituality and, and being, comfortable in my own skin, having a, a, a strength that is not me, because at the end of the day, like I'm not the center of the world, no matter how much I want it to be, I am not the center of the world. Um, <laughs> and so it's been this, it, yeah, it, it, it's a trip to see how, how deep we'll go just to chase our ego, just to fill that, you know, false sense of pride that we think we have to have or to hold that image. And food is one of those things is, you know, we're constantly presented with the ideal human body. Like this is, this is what we're supposed to be. This is what we're supposed to be. This is what we're supposed to be. And it's not like, it's not, you know, we can achieve these things through nutrition, through health, through activity. You know, we can achieve what, whatever we want. And I think that we get lost in the idea that, oh, this is unachievable. But it's like, it's just, it seems so insurmountable, right? You know, for myself at my, at my heaviest, I was 260 pounds, just completely obese, couldn't, couldn't do anything, just tired and sluggish. And, you know, it was such a big idea to stop eating candy, right? Just, to just walk away from candy, to walk away from Big Macs, to walk away from all these things. And someone at that time said to me, I was like, just stop one thing. Why do you have to do everything at once, right? Why can't you just, you know, let go of candy this week? And then, you know, maybe next week you don't need a Big Mac. Like, and that was so hard for me to understand. But when I did it, when I took that little tiny, that little tiny step of, okay, no sugar this week, then everything else kind of, you know, becomes easier. You know, it, it's, it, it's amazing. Like sugar is one hell of a drug. People talk about cocaine, but I tell you what, sugar, like, that is, that is the number one, uh, for me is, you know, I still, if, if I get on a binge, I will binge and I go until I'm sick. And, you know, again, like having a head full of knowledge doesn't stop me from experiencing these poor choices, <laughs> you know, like, right, you know, right. It, unless I really have goals set in front of me, I am susceptible to a hundred percent 
of everything that I preach against. Um, and so I've really tried to be more transparent with clients too, because a lot of times I share all this knowledge with my clients and they're like, oh man, you must eat like this. You must work out every day. You've got to do all these things. All the things are right. Like, whoa, nope. That's how I got my ego in the bad place to begin with. I have to tell you the truth here. No, I ate, you know, three of these natural candy bars yesterday. Like, you know, I didn't work out today. Like, you know, I, don't get me wrong. Like I have the knowledge that I can share, but putting the discipline into action is, is on the individual. Right. And that starts with me. Um, and it's a hard, it's a hard pill to swallow. I was talking to a friend on a hike, you know, I went for a hike this morning and I was talking to a friend about it. It's like, it's so easy for me to make the right decision on my own health and nutrition, but it's even easier to just like sit and slaw. Right. It's just, yeah. it's, it's so easy for my brain to be like, Oh, you can take the day off today. And then all of a sudden three weeks later, I'm like, man, that was a long day off. <laughs> so, uh, well, you I'm, know, I think it's, I think it's a matter too of like finding that balance because yeah, there are some days you need some rest, you know, and then, uh, you know, and, so, and I think sometimes when we are so tired that it takes us so long to get back to it is that we have overdone it, you know? And so finding the, okay, so is this too much? And so that's what I think happens in the very beginning for most people is like when you, when you're, I love how you say it's take the small steps because the small steps will bring that awareness to, are you overdoing it? And what you can start to pay attention to that more instead of doing everything all at once. And it's kind of hard to figure out like, um, and also to st stay consistent with something because it's almost too overwhelming uh, because we're creating new patterns. We're creating change in our life. And so we, it needs to happen one step at a time so we can integrate that. So that integration process is, I think, what people um, tend to bypass with, within this. They think just, you know, starting you know, just starting the action or, you know, is, is only like the first step. And, but really what comes from that is, is, you know, old wound healing, like, cause we're, we're really navigating from old wounds until we, uh, we become aware of that. When we've become aware of that, like you have, Andrew, then you, then you start to understand how much easier it is to stick with habits because you value them. Now you're looking at it from a different perspective than you were when you were wounded, right. Or traumatized and, or programmed a certain way. So when we can just kind of lift those blocks and become aware of those, then it becomes much easier to uh, take full responsibility for that. Like as a mature adult, because now we are you know, we're, we're lighthearted. We're not super serious. Like we're, but we're sincere about what our, what we value. Right. So we follow through with that and that's what mature adults do, you know? Um, and so I, I just think that is, is so beautiful. The process you've gone through because it, it's exactly where you need to be. And, um, you know, it's like giving your space, self space for it to be awkward, you know, cause there's going to be times where that's going to happen. It's going to feel really weird, you know, because you're just stepping into a new part of yourself. Like you haven't been yourself for a long time. I know that as a, you know, as a people pleaser and a perfectionist in the past, like you were so much trying to be somebody else and fit in and get people accept you and affirm you that you forget who you really are. And when you start to go towards who you really are, it, it becomes like really uncomfortable because it's like you're just kind of exposing yourself, you know, in a way. So uh, it, it really takes a lot of courage to go down that path. And so um, I really congratulate you for that because you've come so far in your realization. And, and so you're helping so many more people with that now because you have that awareness of um, how to show up as yourself and you can help other people with that too through, you know, honoring the value first of like what you're eating, what you're putting in your body, like that's important, you know? <laughs> it's good. It, it, and that's where it all starts, you know? It's, yeah. uh, it, it begins with that first bite of, of whatever it is. And, you know, when you're eating, when I'm eating clean, when I'm eating like home cooked food, like real ingredients, not a bunch of processed stuff, I feel better. And it's so much easier for me to just make the right decision because I'm already eating this way. So I might as well go for a walk because, you know, yeah. why am I going to, you know, what else am I going to do? You know, yeah. oh, I should read this book because I feel good about what I'm doing right now. And 
you know, again, that gets back to mentorship and having people, uh, men in my life that have taken the time to really, you know, Hey, this is going to help you, but never shoving it down my throat, you know, never forcing me to be like, Hey, this is the way I think. So you have to think this way. It's, it's uh, you know, I, I have a mentor now who really asked me a lot of questions. Well, why do you think this? This is what I think. This is what I've found. What do you think? And having someone that does that or like questions me or kind of forces me to, to slow down and think about how I'm going to speak or, or what I'm going to say next or how I'm going to use my words is, is been huge in my life, right? Like, I mean, even, you know, you get, again, I'm kind of bouncing around, but getting back to, to egos, you know, being on, on Food Network, right? Being on Chopped or being on, you know, uh, Supermarket Stakeout is all of a sudden millions of people know who I am for 30 minutes, right? And so that 30 minutes of the idea in my head, like, this is who I have to be because millions of people know me. No, they don't. Like, no, they don't. They know me for 30 minutes while I'm on this show. That's that's the extent of how long they know me for. And, you know, it's so easy for me to be like, well, you don't know who I am, you know, and it's <laughs> it, it it feeds my ego. And periodically, you know, I'll, I'll run into situations where I'm currently a rerun. Um, and oh, yeah. So, yeah, my, my chopped episode is on this rerun cycle, and it, it, it's not on any of the. It's not. It's not on any of the streaming platforms, but you can catch it on a rerun. And I was at the gym, and there I am on TV, and this person on the the treadmill next to me looks at the TV, looks at me, looks at the TV, looks at me, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden, like I have to walk around the gym with my chest pumped out, and like you know who I am on TV, you know. Um, but, you know, getting back to the mentorship is like having having someone in my life that can ground me and help with, hey, no, this is the task at hand, like how you can do that. Like, what's your process? Yeah. What's your thought? Um, it's huge, you know, so. Yeah. So we don't get caught up in the shiny objects, right, in our life because yeah. I've, I've done that too. <laughs> so it can easy. be very enticing. Yeah, it's so easy. Is it? Oh, Our that's egos. Exactly from my, my goal. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then when you start to heal, heal yourself and, and become aware of like those, uh, those deeper programs within you, it's like, oh my God, like, no, I don't want that at all. Like, yeah. no. Right? It's like repulsive. It's yeah. Like, why? why was I doing that? Like, yeah. Uh. <laughs> You needed it for a certain, yeah. some reason, right? Right. Well, that's awesome. Well, Andrew, uh, I feel like we covered just about everything. Like <laughs> this was an amazing interview. Uh, do you, will you just uh, share like what you're offering now, what you want to share with uh, in closing for our interview today? Because um, I know you, you offer a lot of amazing things. You do, you do also do like uh, private, um, bow hunting you do well you do bow hunting on your own but you do these private um uh hunting events right and um what else is there that you that you offer you also yeah, I, personal I do a little bit of everything all yeah. in the the personalized uh, uh realm you know i act as a personal chef for folks that just want to you know have a properly cooked meal in their home once or twice a week uh, i go camping with people and so if folks want to go camping and they don't want to do food or they want to have an upgraded experience of food in the woods, um, I travel for that. Um, I'm also going to be this fall, I'll be doing guided uh, foraging trips on chanterelle, bullet mushrooms, uh, stuff like that. And then uh, I also offer wild game cooking courses um, and butchery. Oh. So folks that are out there learning how to hunt, uh, I love talking to them and kind of consulting them on how to do things. Um, and saving them time and money on how to process in our own animals and how to eat the whole animal and not just throw away the liver and the kidneys and the heart and the tongue. Um, so that, but you know, I, anything that has to do with food, I will spend time talking to folks and see if I can help them with, you know, just developing some recipes that are easy to cook at home. So that's amazing. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks for oh, being there. Pleasure. Do you have a Do you have a website, by the way, that you can mention? Uh, to oh yeah, you? it's uh, chefandrewgarrett.com. That's okay. two R's and two T's. And I'll I'll put that link in the show notes as well. Perfect. All right. Thanks so much, Andrew. Oh, it's my pleasure. Your life is your greatest work of art, and it all relates back to the synchronicities. <laughs>